following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verana Media Network. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on Gen XYZ this evening and as you all know this is a program where we talk about pertaining uh, problems we face in the country right now and how the youth can be engaged and help in uh, solving these issues and what the youth can do per se. So today we are going to talk about the pertaining issue which is obviously the economic crisis and how this has affected the agriculture sector and how urban agriculture would be a solution to solve this issue. And to discuss on this topic, we have a very familiar guest, uh, Mr. Malin Senviratna, the director of the Hekka, uh, Hector Kobagadava Ag Agrarian Research and Training Institute. Mr. Malin, thank you very much. You, you are not uh, new on these shows and you are very familiar at Derana as well. Thank you for taking the time to join me today on I the show. I'm glad to be here. And so, uh, sir, to start off the discussion, is it true that Sri Lanka would be going into a state of famine very soon. Uh, I wouldn't use the word famine, right? We are a tropical country after all. Uh, and it's not that uh, we don't have the resources to sort out the problems that, uh, that currently we are facing. But they are according to later studies done by various researchers and including the World Health Organization, we would be suffering um, uh, food shortages and, and that is not only because of the fertilizer policy <coughs> there is also the Ukraine uh, there are global factors which are, Im which are impacting because uh, like the fertilizer you need uh, most of it is uh, coming from uh, Russia um, at least the ingredients urea <coughs> and uh, then uh, because of the embargoes uh, sanctions on Russia uh, where, we, where uh, the world is facing a grain crisis so those things have where we are going to get our wheat from, but the what's going to happen to the price of bread. So there is a certainly a very serious situation that we, we are facing and uh, it won't impact everyone the same way, whether it is the rich countries will buy, the, buy the, uh, all the food that they can because they have to satisfy the calorie uh, requirements of their population. In countries like Sri Lanka, the, the richer people will do the same thing. There will be hoarding, there will be black markets, there will be all those things. And then we have urban populations and rural populations, which is what I want to talk about. The uh, farming communities can manage. You know, if they don't have uh, fertilizer to grow rice, they can still grow other crops like uh, batala, manioc, and you know, all these other things. And we have like 90 uh, types of uh, you know, yams. yams that we can, uh, probably 50, 60 or more uh, things which we can use as maldung. So, we, th but, but what do you do about people who don't have the capacity to purchase, who cannot grow, which is essentially the uh, urban poor and the daily income earners. So, there will be an issue on one side, uh, availability, uh, then affordability because of the you know, as everyone knows, uh, the the rate of inflation is unprecedented, and obviously, your real incomes are, are have gone down very sharply. So you might have to figure out how you are going to spend the money you have, and then also uh, utilization. What kind of food are we going to eat, and are we wasting food? Also, whether people talk about post harvest losses, but food waste is actually greater than that. Right, we waste a lot of food, and that the, that can be that can be sorted out. There can be solutions to that kind of thing. So all these things need to be looked at carefully, and we can we need to figure out how we as citizens. Let's say we forget the government. The government is not they're incompetent. They're corrupt. This that, and all the other things that have been talked about the last few months. Forget that. Are we waiting for uh, the perfect government uh, to sort out the the problems of our children's hunger? Uh, at some point, we can't do that. At some point, we have to think in terms of 
as a community, you know, as, as communities. You know, we have a village, we are, we are from Jaila, I'm from Kottava. We all live in uh, areas, we are uh, living in a culture which is very friendly. We talk to all these people, whether it's a temple or the church or whatever, we meet people. And uh, we can work together if we want. If we can agitate together, why can't we work together? I mean, uh, uh, for, for something. And I think, uh, therefore, the word famine, uh, we could get there if we just, you know, sat on, um, you know, just uh, twiddled our thumbs and did nothing about it. But when you realize that there's a problem, and for some people it's an everyday problem, it's not something that's going to come in October, it's something that's happening today. But if, uh, as a community, say in the village that I live, if any child goes without uh, three uh, meals a day, then there's no point blaming the government. We can blame the government and, and all the governments before this government because this is not something that happened the, the last two months. It's like a 40 year kind of process. But if as a community which where we have food, we can grow food, we don't do that and a child goes without food, then at some level we are culpable. So sir, how soon do you think that we will be able to come into this critical state? Uh, well, according to the uh, World Health Organization, uh, they're thinking of October, so we have time. And it's not that nothing is happening. For example, uh, since the, uh, the, the, the stress will be most on urban population, say Colombo, the Colombo Municipal Council, uh, under the, uh, the good market, the people at the good market, they, are, they do a lot of organic agriculture and you know, wholesome foods because we talk about, uh, it's not just volume, it's about nutritional requirements. So you have to have healthy foods. There's no point growing fluff, you know. Uh, uh, it's not uh, our ability to purchase a, a hamburger or, or say a, a, a submarine sandwich, but whether we are eating healthy. How we how can we grow? So the good market, the Kalamba Municipal Council, the security forces, a lot of voluntary uh, voluntary organizations, youth groups, UN agencies, they are all working together to because see if we look at Colombo, say you go to a high rise and look around, uh, you're flying if you have money to fly in a helicopter, you look like it's very green. Uh, we are an agricultural uh, culture. We have a little bit of space, we let least put a a chili plant, right? So it's not that, it, it's, I think it's in our genes at some level. So uh, there are lots of efforts to utilize the space. We don't see the space that we can use. Right? Now you, you have a garden, it might be a, in your house and everything might be on a 10, 10 perch plot of land. But uh, there'll be some soil you can grow. Supposing you don't have any soil, but you can still have pots. You can still grow up because uh, you know land or space is not two dimensional; it's three dimensional. It's from from below the ground, then you have yams like manioka, uh, batalan, kiriyala, rajala, thisala, thatala, right up to the coconut trees, 40, 50, 60 feet up above the ground. Uh, we have that all that is space that can be used for for agriculture for growing. But you got to be intelligent about it. What are you going to grow? What can be grown? There's enough information now. The young X Y Z generations, they are internet savvy. They they can mine information very easily. You know, much faster than I can. They can find out what is what are the successes, what is being done well. And okay, you don't have you don't have uh, certain kinds of uh, say inputs. What are the alternatives? All that is out there, right? So I think that uh, there is an immense potential, not just to sort out the coming food crisis, but to s change the way we think about food, the change the way we think about our lives, the th change the ways that we l think about each other as individuals, as a community, as households. So I think that uh, we are not, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we are not, we should not be thinking in disaster. We are not helpless. I think, sir, I, you gave a very good insight about, you know, what we can do in terms of urban agriculture. But uh, how do you think people will take this socially and economically? Do you think that they are accepting this type of change? Well, I think that we are a society that has been mollycoddled for too long, right? We have been, uh, we have been 
kind of educated to be dependent. Right? We wait for the World Bank to bail us out. We wait for the IMF to bail us out. We wait for the government sub subsidies. Now we have a fuel crisis uh, and um, we don't uh, pause to think that you know, fuel has been subsidized for, for so many years. And it's not only the poor who are subsidized, it's the very rich people who could afford were subsidized. Right? So uh, in a sense, there is that issue, you wait till the 5,000 rupee, uh, the padu malla, whatever comes, or the, or the handout. But then uh, when you know that uh, you, uh, uh, your incomes have gone down, right, and you, your, your purchasing capacity obviously has, uh, has declined, when you know that uh, you can't, uh, no one is giving you any, any assurances that the state will move in and distribute food. Where is the food to distribute? Because there is a, a certain shortage. It doesn't look like as though you know, people are like lining up to uh, bring uh, ships of food to Sri Lanka. We don't see, but there's, an, there's a global crisis going on. Everyone is, we, we see only Sri Lanka because that's, what, that's where we are. But all these countries have these problems, and they are also thinking about you know, doing something for their people uh, into the future. Uh, so whether we like it or not, who likes to dig the earth? Someone might ask, right? But until you start it, you won't, uh, you might not, uh, but once you start doing something, you get used to it, and there's fulfillment. We saw this during the COVID-related uh, lockdowns the last two years. They were stuck at home. They did not know. They, they didn't have anything to do. They couldn't go anywhere. So they, they started growing things. Uh, sometimes uh, now I tell people that you know I spend more time mm, in the garden than inside the house because uh, I live uh, with uh, with uh, two daughters and my wife, and they have, they, they they have their own worlds, you know. Uh, and my daughters are too old to have interesting conversations with me. So. I have conversations with the birds and the squirrels <laughs> and the plants. But I, uh, your question, uh, we, it's not something that we need to relearn. It's something we already know. And, uh, you know, if a desperate situation calls for desperate uh, measures. What are you going to do if, you know, you, you can't, you can't buy enough food. There is no food to buy. What are you going to do? Right? At some level, you will start thinking, okay, there's so, many, so much of coarse, del, amber, Umbrella, all these things which we have just not really harvested. We look around and we say, oh, I never planted tebu, but there's tebu growing, right? I never planted that, but that is also growing. Uh, so you look around and you suddenly find that you have the eyes to recognize the food that you have not grown, but because we are such a, uh, you know, we are an island that is so blessed in so many ways, there's stuff. But we have been used, we have been taught, and we have got uh, into a food culture where we look for carrot, uh, uh, cabbage, beetroot, leeks, that kind of thing. It's, it's really, at some level it's funny that we are a net fruit importing country, right? What do we see as fruit? We see apples, oranges, and grapes as fruits, right? Now, we don't realize that we have so many varieties of plantains. Right, you know, uh, you know, you name it, there's so much food, but we don't see the food, even if we have it. And, uh, but now we have not only got to see the food, but we have to see the food that is not there, plant it. And there are short term, you can grow healthy things like, uh, say, winged bean, dambala, the, uh, you know, makara, uh, uh, bandaka, you know, all these things, you know, all the, all the maldung types, the palavar, all those things we can grow, even in an urban setting. Now, there may be problems in, you know, uh, very poor, say, communities, uh, slum shanty kind of uh, low income, where there's space problem. But there also, you can have a couple of plants, but then there, there, can, there is a concept called community uh, farming. There, there's always space that is common property. Now, people don't talk about common property. People talk about private property and public property. But there's also common property. Japan developed on common property, right? So, common spaces, marginal spaces, which we didn't think we could grow food on, we can grow food on. Right? There are, you know, sidewalks on the sides, the roundabouts. If, if you really want to find space, you can find space. 
All right, sir. Thank you for your insight. But to hold on that topic, we'll be continuing the discussion after this break. You're watching Gen XYZ. We'll be back soon and we are in discussion with Marlene Senira. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we are in discussion with uh, Marlene Dusenvi Ratna who is the director of the Hector Kopaya Gadua Agrarian Research and Training Institute. I think, sir, in the first uh, session we spoke about a lot of things and something that I picked up on was when you said like people might be having money, it's just the problem that we don't have resources right now even to buy food. So let alone the urban agriculture, in the rural agriculture also do you see a depletion of resources? We do, but then why do you think this is so? Well, okay, if you have been growing rice and if you have been uh, using certain kinds of seed varieties which require uh, the kinds of inputs that you need to import and we don't have the foreign exchange to import, right, or the, or it's the prices are prohibitive, uh, then you're going to have a, have a problem. Uh, so, but when you think of the nation and you think of the nutritional requirement of the entire population, people talk about fortified rice so that you can get the nutrition. But then we have not taken into consideration the traditional rice varieties, which, are, which have been proven to be far more nutrition than the hybrid varieties that we have been uh, growing for the last so many years. You know, all, the, all the lies of the Green Revolution that we just uh, swallowed are very uncritically. But okay, so people are you know, growing rice not just for consumption but for, uh, as a, as an, to, to earn an income. And it's not that you, know, you eat everything that you grow, you, you sell it, you buy other things that you need. Not just food but other things, how do, uh, medicines or you know, children's education, whatever. So, uh, since there is going to be a decline, there already is a decline in, in production, uh, then that will obviously lead to a decline in incomes. So their lifestyles that they had previously cannot be maintained. You have to make uh, certain choices about your consumption uh, patterns that you have been used to, right? Right now, okay, uh, a simple example, we don't have fuel. So people are taking public transport, they're using public transport, they're walking, they're um, uh, using bicycles, uh, they're cutting down on their travel, you know, your, your social life gets, so your lifestyle gets, so there are adjustments that can be made because like we've been living on borrowed money, borrowed time for years, you know, time that and money that we borrowed from generations yet unborn. And uh, we are so, uh, you know, self-congratulatory and uh, self-righteous that we don't realize that we have been part of the problem, that uh, we have indulged ourselves at the cost of uh, a lot of other people who are yet unborn. Uh, so it's time for us to be to be responsible. So the, the rural setting, as you mentioned, there are certain other things that they can do. I mean, there are other crops that they can grow. Uh, but whether typically when there's an economic crisis, uh, what happens is that uh, it impacts rural communities, uh, poor communities, uh, hard in terms of the kind of foods that they ought to be uh, eating. So it's uh, different. Uh, we need to have a kind of a paradigm shift, uh, not just in the things that we do, but the way that we think about the things that we ought to be doing. Um, sometimes circumstances force us to do that. Sometimes uh, uh, re realization hits, you know, oh my God, what have you been doing all these years? You know, we've been just doing crap. Uh, so we try to do things differently. So that is not uh, uh, specific to a village or a city or a township or uh, an apartment complex. It, it cuts across your thinking differently. Uh, but all this uh, takes time. That you know, if you don't start now, uh, you don't plan for the future. You're not going to. You're going to be in in, in deep trouble. You know, a few months, not not few years down the line, the few months uh, down the line. So you got to plan. Uh, now the program that the Colombo Municipal Council Deputy Commissioner Mrs. Sylvester is in charge. Of, and she's an engineer. 
uh, with good market and the security forces, they are, they, it's a planned project. I mean, they are, they, are, they, are, they are looking at what can be done, what can be grown. We don't want everyone to be growing um, brinjals or, or, or you know, okra, ladies' fingers. You want, uh, you know, you can tell uh, any institute, every government institute, whatever uh, space is available, whether it's a corridor or a garden, use it to grow food. So, uh, uh, you know, for example, at the Agrarian Research and the back at the Agrarian Research and Training Institute, we have divided the space we have accord, uh, among the departments, right? But the departments uh, don't get to decide what they are going to grow because everyone might be growing chili. That's not going to help us. But so you it's, it's about planning. It's it's not rocket science. You can figure out what you can grow and figure out a way of uh, you know distribution at the right time. And what happens is okay. Someone might say okay. So you are, you you will grow uh, uh, say uh, uh, you will grow uh, winged bean, dambala, or you grow uh, uh, you know caravilla, uh, bitter good. And uh, so you are going to eat that the whole year. Uh, what happens is if you grow something, it is better than growing nothing. Right? That means you don't have to spend that amount of money. You are saving a little bit of money. You can give the excess to your neighbor. You are not going to uh, die. I mean, but, but you lose by that. So I think it's, uh, these kinds of situations are good because it uh, forces people to recognize their neighbors. You know? And uh, see, we, we say, like the, love thy neighbor. We say, the Sattva, Bhavan Sukhitattva, may all beings be happy, but is that just a slogan? Can't we go beyond that? Can't we put it into practice, operationalize it, make it real and meaningful and wholesome? I think we can do that. So you gave uh, solutions for community farming, mm -hmm. but another problem that uh, people might think, okay, we can do vertical agriculture mm -hmm. as well, but do you think that's sufficient to feed our whole family? Probably in one wine of, you know, Dambala, there might be just two, two karal. So some people complain about that. We are putting so much of effort, mm. but we are only flourishing with just a little. It depends on what, how you are going to grow. I mean, you will get some advice from someone. There are uh, agricultural uh, extension workers everywhere. You can ask them for advice. You can go to the internet. I mean, if you're living in some high-rise apartment complex, you surely you have some data which you can use to, to do some research. And uh, it's not like uh, just getting two, two uh, karal from one, one plant. And they, you can probably harvest certain kinds of things every, every three weeks, every uh, four weeks. And uh, okay, if you do nothing, then you have to buy it. And then you can't complain, oh, my, my, my uh, real income has gone down. And even if uh, I have enough money, there's no, nothing, nothing to buy. You know, what, what am I going to buy? So, it, it's it's the we I mean, look at the aggregate, right? If everyone did something, if everyone contributed something, grew something, anything, right? Say even passion fruit. Passion fruit you can eat the leaves also. You, uh, there's crow comes and drops something, and you get a um, you get a, uh, a wine. papaya a papaya tree. Right? right. We don't grow. We don't grow that. I mean, in our gardens, everyone has some, uh, you know, pepper. We never grew it. Some crow ate something, uh, came and dropped crow droppings. We are so blessed. But if we do nothing, right, then, then we can't complain. Right? So we have to be able to do something, uh, the little bit that we can. And if you say, okay, I'm going to grow something, uh, you're going to grow something, can, can this feed the, uh, the entire population? No, it's not that. Uh, we put together everything that we grow and measure the requirement and say, okay, there's a shortfall of 90%, right? But if we didn't do that, there'd be a shortfall of 100%. On the other hand, there's stuff that's been growing commercially. I mean, that's also happening. But if we all did this and we did the proper calculation, did the data collection, we can figure out how much would <coughs> food we do, do we need. Like the World Food Program can say, okay, Sri Lanka needs this much, right? And um, not, and we can go further into the details and say in Sri Lanka, these particular areas need this ki has this kind of requirement, like the urban areas uh, in in certain parts, because this is something which will impact 
certain classes of people in certain parts of the country more uh, than it does others. So you can have your relief targeted. Otherwise you will say, okay, Sri Lanka, okay, we have this uh, 22 million population, the overall calorie requirement is this much, one person, so therefore uh, this is the amount of wheat you need, this is the amount of rice you need, we doesn't happen that way. But if we don't look at what we can do as individuals, as households, as villages, as communities, then we are, we are essentially putting aside uh, a lot, I mean, the contribution that can go to mitigate this. It's not going to be a solution, but it is a, it's a part of the solution, an important part of the solution which can have long-term positive impact on how we see ourselves, uh, each other, and the lifestyles that we, we rethink our lifestyles. We have not been living healthy. What have we been doing? Right? Um, we, didn't, we never had a problem with obesity. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, there weren't people, like when I was your age, we didn't see people walking around Independence Square. What happened? How did that happen? Right? There's food cultures. You know. So maybe this is a good time. Uh, you know, you can look at the positives, not to trivialize it, not to downplay it, but uh, there are always, you know, in a crisis, you have to see, you're forced to see, look for opportunities, recognize them and seize them and do something positive, you know, which will impact uh, the country as a whole for a long time. The next question arises, sir, for your health and right. nutrition. Now, um, some time ago, there was a fertilizer ban, thinking that the country is going to go organic. Mm. So, but now, even when considering urban farming, there are people complaining, no, there are caterpillars eating the fruit or, or whatnot, and they have to use pesticides. So, is that recommended? This have to use something, it's like saying, this is our last chance to get the, get the best kind of precedent that, I don't know, last chances. Oh, time is long, you know, what, what is, well, you're measuring time in terms of uh, your lifetime in a country which has a written history of 2,500 years, it's a uh, history of agriculture which goes back b beyond that. So, uh, uh, you must have pesticides, you must have this, that and the other. Wh what do you do if you don't have it? You stop growing? You find alternatives, there are enough alternatives. It's, but Sometimes, and it, at the household level, yes, you can, because there's food waste. Well, ha at the household, you are not going to dump uh, toxic uh, stuff into your garden. You will dump the waste, so soils are okay. Commercial agriculture is different, you know, large scale, and then you can't really, it's, then you have to have the manufacturing processes in place, and uh, you know, you must have the testing facilities, you must have the certification. Where someone can package something and say this is uh, compost, but it might, might be just so soil that you kind of uh, picked up from your back garden. Uh, but uh, there are many ways of managing pests and other, other, you know. So there are caterpillars, there are snails, there are ways in which you manage those things. You know, there are, uh, there are systems of integrated pest management. I and mean, you should not be talking to me, you should be talking to someone in the agriculture department. They are, they, we have the science. To do this thing, the science so they don't have to talk to anyone. You look uh, look on the web. You look in tropical countries, pest management in tropical countries. I'm sure you come up, come up with a lot of solutions. But if you're lazy, if you want to come up with reasons for not doing something, that is up to you. But what if you are going to get into a situation where no one is going to come to your help? Right? It's the story of the uh, you know the big uh, the, the three little pigs and the and the wolf, right? Someone, and, and the whole story of the ant and the grasshopper. Uh, you're lazy, you suffer the consequences. We cannot afford to be lazy anymore. That's true. I think now people would have probably got an idea. It's important to find alternatives without trying to find excuses in some way or the other. So we'll have to go into another short commercial break. We are in discussion with Malin the Senimiratna. We'll be back soon.
welcome back to Gen X Y Z, and we are in discussion with Malin Dasanviratna, the director of the Hectaco Bagadu Agrarian Research and Training Institute. So, to build up on the discussion before the break, now people need to be encouraged. They need some motivation to do this urban agriculture. And right now, I think people are they have no choice but to go into these types of agriculture. Um, what is your institute up to these days in order to promote this urban uh, agriculture? Right. Well, one. Uh, our institute mostly does, some people don't know, they confuse agrarian with agriculture. Uh, what we mostly do is uh, research and training, uh, economic and social uh, aspects pertaining to agriculture, various aspects of agriculture. But with, re with regard to the, the issue of food uh, production and urban agriculture and home gardening, uh, we publish a monthly newspaper called Govimina, which we distribute freely. Uh, and from next month, we are starting a supplement called Gevatta, which uh, uh, along with, uh, with the support of some other organizations, uh, where we actually give people some ideas about what to plant, when, where, uh, and what are the things, answering questions like the one, well, what about uh, further, well, how are we going to deal with the snails and the caterpillars, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and also we, you know, one of the most important things that we do is we do, we have training programs. And in the training programs, uh, these uh, issues are talked about. Mm -hmm. if, we are, if we are training a group of, uh, say, development officers in, in some part of the country, uh, even if we might not have be exper experts on, on, on a particular thing, we can always get, uh, you know, find the expertise that is required. Uh, to do that. And then on a very practical sense, we are also growing food. Right? Uh, no, last year there was no talk about uh, agriculture, but we grew uh, turmeric. And uh, towards the end of last year, we decided to uh, start a nursery, like, uh, you know, grow plants and just uh, allow people to buy it uh, in the institute. So they, they go home, they plant it and they, they reap a harvest, something. You know, they, they don't have to buy chilies. You know, that's uh, saving a few bucks. Uh, will we forget that we can save? We can save, we can, uh, thrift is also possible. We only think of credit, which is only one aspect of the whole thing. So uh, the institute uh, is supporting this kind of And we are now uh, in discussion with Colombo Municipal Council, and more than that with Good Market. Uh, uh, Ms. Achala uh, Samaradi Vakrashi has been very helpful. They are going to design, uh, they are going to kind of come up with a plan. Uh, already we have plants and things, but how to maximize the space that we have? Because people come in and out, and it's an uh, uh, institute which is uh, which comes under the Ministry of Agriculture. So it's a model that we can build. You know, people see it. Once you see it, you know it can be done. And then you ask questions: What are you going to do about the caterpillars? Don't you have caterpillars? And I can say, well, this is what we did. Right. Okay. So that's what we are doing right now. Okay, sir. And. Then again, when it comes to the youth, now they are the most energetic crowd here. They have a voice and they, they have the energy to do all of these things. What do you think the youth can do in order to promote this and how can they be involved as well? Yeah, they are one of the biggest problems in um, agriculture in Sri Lanka and a lot of places is that people, uh, young people are moving out of agriculture for various reasons. Uh, but then, uh, in these kinds of crisis situations, now you saw in the last three months, uh, some people called it a, a youth revolt, right? A youth revolution. I wouldn't use the word revolution. That has different connotations, a very positive connotation. Uh, revolt has, is less. It, uh, it's like generally anti-systemic, but typically anti uh, uh, against a particular party or a person. But we saw the energy, the idealism, the ability to work with other people, the sense of solidarity, the creativity, innovation, determination, courage. We saw all that uh, uh, over the last three months. They, for better or worse, they were uh, able to uh, effect a change of government. They, they, they ousted the president, they ousted the prime minister, they had the three different uh, cabinets. Whether that's good or bad is a different matter. But they played a role. The youth played a role. It's not just the youth. Now, obviously, what that indicates to me is the kind of potential that we have. Right? Now, the strength 
an energy that came together over the last three months for a, what I would think is a very limited political project. Because uh, as I tell people in Russia, the, in the Russian revolution is a land, peace and bread. It was not hashtag uh, kill the Tsar. In the French Revolution, it was liberty, uh, liberty, uh, equality, and fraternity. It was not kill King Louis, uh, right? Uh, but that also happened. But they got the revolution. Here, it was just limited, uh, focusing on an individual. Not the system remains. But the potential, the spirit, and the enthusiasm, and even patriotism. Not among all the all kinds of people in this Saragalia, and I, I have my issues with them. But by and large, the youth showed that they can stand up for something, they can deliver, they can come together. Now, what is the most revolutionary thing to do in this moment in Sri Lanka? The, the most revolutionary thing to, go, uh, to do is to recognize that we are in a crisis which we cannot resolve immediately and which has generated a a possible serious food shortage, food crisis. Now here you have the energy. You have people, as it has been said, young people from all over the country came together for this. That's the claim. If young people from all over the country could come together to effect a kind of a change in government regime, change, however you want to name it, then young people can come together, think, figure out things, uh, learn from each other, and make sure that no one in their communities, no one in the, that particular district or your province or whatever way starves. How do you do that? You grow food. You grow food. We are not asking every young person to grow two acres of rice. Every young person can, can grow something, two, three plants or whatever, but together in a village, they can convince another generation. They managed to get the old people out, didn't they? And they were saying, you know, you know we, uh, the old people were saying, we are going to listen to our, young, uh, our children. And the young people said, our parents are listening to us, you know. So, okay, with all the evidence that we've had over the last three months, it is unthinkable for me that the youth of this country cannot find a way of sorting, of contributing positively, effectively, in a way that changes the equation in relation to food availability. And they can exercise all the knowledge, know-how that these XYZ generations have about uh, obtaining the relevant information, not just to grow any old thing, but to be intelligent, to be smart about it. What are we growing? What are the nutritional attributes of this, that, and the other? How do we uh, grow things that can complement each other and, you know, contribute to sorting out the... I think there's immense potential. Right. I don't know how, how it's going to happen, who's going to take the leadership, but I'm sure they'll find ways. I mean, this revolt, the um, it was as disorganized as anything else, but uh, even in that uh, chaotic thing, they managed to get just that amount of coherence that was necessary to obtain a political uh, uh, outcome that they, some of them were happy with. You know. Exactly. Yeah. If they all work together, I think they can make the possible change. I mean, it has been done before and at this time also I think it's possible to do so as well. So in the current situation, do you, where do you see urban agriculture right now? Do you think that there are enough youth programs, whether there are programs conducted by schools or communities? Where do we stand well, now? Uh, the uh, school system is also in a crisis, but uh, all government institutions, schools, temples, uh, you know, anything. Uh, all the municipal councils, urban councils, the Pradesh Sabhas, you know, all the urban councils mostly. Uh, they have been mandated to, uh, tasked to engage in this and they are doing whatever they can. Uh, probably not making a big, uh, you, know, uh, you know, crying, uh, shouting about it and putting up posts on, uh, on social media. But a lot of stuff is happening uh, and uh, of course you can't say, uh, show me what has happened. A lot of things are happening, it's, it's not as coordinated as, as it should be. But uh, I can say this for most definitely the Colombo Municipal Council is doing a lot of work, uh, you know, using all the marginal 
the all the available lands give, making it possible for voluntary uh, volunteer group, groups to uh, young of young people to uh, you know grow food especially with the so with the involvement of good market people who run good market who are very i mean they have the knowledge the know how um, they can design uh, what should then the questions the, where are you going to get the seeds what are, what are the pesticides they will give you solutions to that so i think that uh, if colombo can do it then so to other lesser less urban i mean colombo is the biggest urban kind of uh, space that we have but then if something happens in Colombia, why can't it happen in Kandy? Exactly. And I think it's possible. And uh, another question, sir, there's this concept of digital farming mm. which is uh, happening in international mm. uh, countries, uh, overseas. Uh, where do you see agriculture reforming in Sri Lanka right now? Do you think we can implement that? <laughs> well, it's, uh, in the end, it's about uh, information, data, and use, uh, useful data, usable data, and having the kinds of mechanisms apps and whatever the, the the software that you require that is necessary to enable policy makers ordinary citizens farmers whoever to uh, obtain the information that they require quickly right so that and the and uh, as far as policy goes uh, the platforms uh, integrated platforms where the various data sets that are collected by various organizations are uh, in one on platform that that enables anyone to make use of them very fast and of course uh, then you need some uh, data packages and then you know the whole business of signals and but in the first instance you must have that and there is it's not that there is no information we collect uh, a lot of uh, data on prices uh, we have uh, of 106 commodities and the nutrition attributes are there uh, and uh, we are computing the cost of um, uh, diets so that people will uh, have the information they need to figure out what they should purchase and what they should not. Now you might see something for 200 rupees and you might see something for 220. So you buy the 200 thing uh, because it's cheaper. But then you are not, uh, not computing the nutritional uh, worth of each of these of these two come out, you're not comparing those. You might find out if you did that, the 221 is, 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 the, is the better choice. So, but for that, you need to have the information. So, when you talk digital things, uh, you know, all that is part of the, of, the, of the whole thing. Then there are other things like how to calculate uh, uh, trade for land, you know, how to uh, compute insurance, whether based insurance. There are lots of possible, I mean, there is limitless. I'm not an IT expert, but you should get these people to come and talk, talk to you about those kinds of things. I might be talking nonsense, uh, to be honest. And uh, I also hope that uh, on these kinds of programs, at some point, you get uh, the good market people, uh, you know, in some, there has all kinds of shows where. But they, they have done this, they know. They know what the problems are. They, so you, know, I might, uh, you and I might start a farm and we'll be reinventing the wheel, when the wheel has been invented you know, so many centuries ago. Right, thank you sir. I think we are reaching the end of our program as well as my last question. What would you say is the next step that the youth can take in order to promote this urban agriculture? The next step that they can take, a small step per se, the people who are starting now. Yeah, uh, well, First of all, well, they, they redefine Aragalea uh, to be a more uh, for people thing in a real sense in terms of the people's most urgent needs. Given that we might have a serious food crisis, that thinking, changing, that's the first thing, right? And then, uh, if it's just an individual, well, the we have space, you have space. Find some place to grow something. If there's no space, you just throw some seeds somewhere. Do something, do something. And young people are not stupid. Young, I mean, this world belongs to them. This earth belongs to them, not to me, right? It belongs to people like you. And uh, what this earth turns out to be 20 years from now, will depend on what generation X, Y, and Z do right now. And they have the passion, 
the knowledge, the enthusiasm and the vision to do that. Seize the world, seize it, seize it, this is yours. Right, thank you very much, sir, for that inspirational advice. I think the youth can also pick up on this and be motivated and be able to start something new. And I also believe if there's a will, there is a way, because this has been done before, and why not do it again for a better cause? Again, Malin the Senviratna, sir, thank you for taking the time to join me on the show and for your insights as well. Glad to be and that was our episode on Gen XYZ. We will be back again next week with another pertaining topic and how the youth can be involved in order to uh, remit or solve these problems, I would say. So just in case you can watch us on air, you can always watch us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Stay safe and have a good night. <laughs>